there. Welcome to Skeleton Key Productions. I'm Crime Graves Cocon. Let's get into the video. Today's video, we're continuing with our film reviews uh, playlist, and we're going to be continuing with our uh, look at different uh, Disney films. And today's Disney film that we're looking at is none other than Cinderella from 1950. So, obviously, don't forget to hit the like button, subscribe if you haven't already. Uh, obviously, about three quarters of you haven't subscribed yet. And don't forget to obviously to hit the bell button as well and that way you stay notified whenever we have a new releases out but before we kind of do that what we have to do whenever we're looking at these film reviews is bear in mind that we have six different sections when we're doing them so we have section one which is the story of the story section two which is the story of the creator section three which is the story of the studio section four which is the themes in the history section five which is the legacy and section six, which is the notable lines and notable effects within the film. So without further ado, we're going to dive straight now into uh, the story of the story and also just one little disclaimer, which is that, well, A, I've got a cold and actually let's put another one in. Spoiler alert, right? There's going to be spoilers in this. Um, and so if you don't like spoilers, skip a little bit ahead um, and yeah, you'll miss it. Yeah, like kind of like just in case you haven't seen it, but yeah. Anyway, just, like, don't be a crybaby, this is a channel that does spoilers, so meh, if you don't like it, go somewhere else. So, in terms of the story of Cinderella, Cinderella is a very old story, right? It goes back all the way to ancient times, we'll talk about that a little bit later. But, for now, what we need to know is that Walt Disney chose a certain version which came from Charles Perlow, right? Now, he's French, so I'll probably pronounce that completely wrong, but... Still, that is the story uh, that, that, that it's kind of based off because obviously there's different variations. So yeah, so without further ado, we're going to dive into the plot of uh, Cinderella from 1950. So the story of Cinderella starts off with Cinderella, she's a young girl, and she lives with her dad. However, because the mum died, he ends up looking for a stepmother for Cinderella called Lady Tremaine. And she has uh, two uh, daughters, so these end up becoming her stepmother and her two uh, stepsisters. And it's not until the death of the father that the true nature of uh, the stepmom and the stepsisters really come out, which is that basically they're evil, right? So what they do is they basically, they get Cinderella to become a slave in her own household. So she ends up cleaning for them, and cooking for them, doing everything for them and stuff, right? So Cinderella at this point, like, you know, she's very kind of like submissive. We'll talk about that a little bit later never says a bad word against them, never really like rebels against them at all. But what she does do is she holds on to her dreams. So she dreams that one day she'll be rescued and swept off her feet by uh, Prince Charming and she will escape this life of servitude. Now Cinderella does have some friends and they're mice and some birds, right? Now I just want to say this, this bit here with the mice and with the cat and with the dog goes on for way too long. We'll talk about that a little bit later, but it's like, the first like 20 minutes of the film is taken up by this kind of stuff. There's a lot of padding in the film, we'll talk about this a bit later. But anyway, so there's lots of stuff with this, but eventually it does move on to seeing just how uh, manipulative and just how like rude um, uh, the evil stepmother are and also the evil stepsisters as well. So while all this is going on at the house, the film cuts to uh, looking at the king. And the king also looks very much like Bismarck, yeah? So Otto von Bismarck, you know, the, the, the famous chancellor of Germany, he looks very much like him. I don't know if that was done on purpose because, I mean, the, the king in this is actually, like, French. So I don't really understand why they got... A, he, he looks German, but anyway. So for him, he really wants uh, to have a grandchild. So he has a son, and this is Prince Charming. So he wants grandchildren, and obviously in order for him to have grandchildren, the prince needs to find a wife. So what he does is he commissions that there's going to be a ball there at the palace that night. And he sends messages all around the kingdom to say any eligible female can come to this thing. So when word of this arrives at Cinderella's household, quite naturally, in spite of the protestations of like her, her stepsisters, she says, well, any eligible females, I'm an eligible female, I should have the right to go. And the stepmother, Lady Tremaine, she says, yes, of course you can go if you finish all your chores. So there's obviously that very much emphasis on the word if, because what they then do is they proceed to give her endless, endless jobs. That means that she can't then work on her dress. 
So it might obviously be very sad, yeah, that Cinderella isn't going to be able to go to the ball and stuff, right? So what they do is they work on the dress, yeah, kind of while she's away. And part of what they end up doing is then going into the stepsister's quarters and the stepsisters have thrown away a pearl necklace, they've thrown away a sash, and what the mice do is they collect these things and put it and make it part of the dress. So when Cinderella comes down the stairs wearing these things, right, all of a sudden, now it's the thing where now they want it. They're very much like children, yeah, like kind of like, you know, little kids when you take away a present from them or you take away a toy, that's the moment that they want to play with it and say, it's mine, it's mine, right? So they end up tearing the, the, the dress to pieces in a very, very uh, malicious way. And obviously the mum allows this, right? So they go off to the ball and Cinderella runs away into the garden. So while she's in the garden, crying her eyes out, this is when the fairy godmother appears. And I just want to make this point, this is almost 42 minutes into a 75 minute film, okay? Just wanted to make that point that she finally shows up, but yeah, it's very, very like, yeah. Anyway, it's just to give you an idea, that's the pivotal part of the story and that doesn't happen until 40 minutes in. But anyway, we, yeah, yeah, we move, we move. Uh, we'll talk about that a bit later. So the fairy good mother turns up, like we said, and what she says is, no, Cinderella, you shall go to the ball. And Cinderella's like, well, how can I go? How am I gonna get there? And she's like, don't worry, I'm gonna do a magic spell. And she does that, you know, this is the Bibbidi Boop uh, song, or Bibbidi, whatever, it's the, the Bibbidi Boop song, right? I forget that, whatever. Um, but anyway, so this is where she turns a pumpkin into a carriage. She turns the mice into horses. She turns the horse into a coachman. And she turns the dog into a page boy, right? So now she's ready to go, although, of course, she needs her dress to be transformed. So this is where the fairy godmother transforms her dress and it looks absolutely stunning. So now Cinderella can go to the ball. However, there's one caveat, which is that at the stroke of midnight, everything will turn back to how it was before, which means that she only has a, a very limited amount of time, but she's still very grateful for this time because, well, it's better than just cleaning dishes, right? So anyway, so she goes to the ball and you know the prince is there he's very bored because he's obviously seen every girl in the the whole kingdom and stuff and it's very tiring for him and the king at this point almost gives up and at this point both of them notice cinderella off in the distance and the prince goes over to cinderella and they dance the night away but for some reason they don't exchange names and at the stroke of midnight she has to run away and also, for some reason, we're also meant to believe that she couldn't work out who the prince was, yeah, which is quite unbelievable. But anyway, we'll, we'll, we'll park that for now. So the prince goes in and, and chases after her and stuff. Uh, the, you know, the cavalry chases after her. But of course, as she's getting away, the coach turns into a pumpkin, the horses turn into mice, etc, etc. So, yeah, it was a nice evening. It was a nice, like, experience. But now, yeah, reality's kind of hit and everything's going back to normal. Or so Cinderella thinks, because the next day she's like, well, that was a wonderful evening and stuff, yeah, and whoever that guy was was like really brilliant. But in the meantime, as this is going on, the prince has sent out an envoy saying that we have a glass slipper, right? So Cinderella had a pair of glass slippers and one of them fell off down the stairs, as we know. And the thing is that he sent out an envoy throughout the whole kingdom to look for the girl who matches this glass slipper. Now, I don't know why they did this yet. So for two things, this is silly, right? One, the obvious thing about shoe sizes, right? And yeah, we understand that. We, that's just the most obvious glaring thing. But I want to make this point, yeah, which is kind of overlooked, which is that she's not wearing a mask. Like at least in the Cinderella story, yeah? So, so uh, the one that comes out in 2004 with Hilary Duff, if you've not seen it, like definitely a great film, go check that out. In that, she's wearing a mask. So you go, okay, this is why she wouldn't, they wouldn't recognize who she is and that's why they had to go through this elaborate thing. But she's not wearing a mask. So you could have just easily been like, who's, you know, go about any blonde girls, come to the palace, anyone who looks like her. Okay, right, that's her. Okay, cool. But anyway, they don't do this. For some reason, they go through this huge like charade. So at this point, this is where the mother tells the stepdaughters and Cinderella that the prince is out on the search. And at this point here, Cinderella works out that the person who she was dancing with last night is indeed the prince. But the stepmother figures this out. And what she does is she decides to lock uh, Cinderella up in the attic. So when the Grand Duke comes to the house to try out the glass slippers on the different females within the house, 
obviously Cinderella is not there, but the stepsisters are there. So the mice, once again, they play Ex Machina. And what they do is that they go into Lady Tremaine's uh, pocket and they uh, get the key from there. It takes them a long time, but they manage to get all the way up to uh, where Cinderella is. And eventually she ends up being rescued. So she comes down and says, you know, try everything on me. And in a last ditch attempt, Lady Tremaine, she trips up the, the page person and, you know, the glass slipper breaks. However, of course, Cinderella has the other glass slipper takes it out, puts it on her feet, and there you go. So what ends up happening then is they end up going to the, the, to the palace, they get married, and then obviously, as always happens, they go off into the sunset and live happily ever after. So that's how Cinderella ends. So, now we've gone through the story of the story, but now we have to talk about the story of the creator and all the different creative processes that went into making uh, this film. So, first of all, we'll talk about uh, this kind of story of the story. So, like we said before, it's a very ancient story, it's a very archetypal story, because although there's been different variations of it, yeah, the same kind of storyline in a basic way has existed all the way back to uh, ancient times. So in the ancient story of Rhodopus, uh, so this is uh, by the uh, Greek historian Strabo, so this was around like the time of like the birth of Christ and stuff. So there was a, a story that went about that uh, there was a Greek slave girl and, uh, you know, she was bathing one day and, you know, her sandals were left on the side and an eagle came, picked up her sandals, flew it over to uh, the king of Egypt. So the pharaoh then picked it up and was like, okay, like whoever like, owns these sandals, I'm going to go for all the maidens in the kingdom and whoever sandals these are, that's going to be my bride. So this same kind of archetypal story type is very, very old and actually stretches across many different cultures, not just in Europe, but also in the Middle East uh, with uh, uh, 1,001 uh, 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 Arabian Nights or something like that, whatever the title for that is. And also in many stories in the Far East as well, yeah, so in China, Japan, Vietnam and Cambodia, they have like kind of these very similar story types. So talking about this story in a European context here, yeah, in the kind of early modern period, you had, uh, first of all, a, a version of it by an Italian man, and this is by Basil, and it was written in 1634 with the title of Sen Senerentola, yeah, Senerentola, something like that, I, I, I can't speak Italian, right? Um, so there's that version there from 1634. Then obviously if we fast forward a bit, yeah, then having a story by the Brothers Grimm, uh, and this is uh, called Aschen Puto, right? So this is obviously German, right? And this version is very, very violent, yeah, um, so you know, there's lots of like vengeance in it. Um, is basically as many things in this which are not like great for a Disney film, right? So the one that uh, Walt Disney ended up picking was the classic one by Charles uh, uh, per per Perriot, right? So this was written in uh, 1697, and we'll talk about more like the kind of a history of that a little bit later. But just know that that's the version that got picked because that's the version which is a nice kind of story and also it has little additions in it, yeah, which are not found in the other ones, such as the pumpkin, such as the fairy godmother, and also such as the glass slippers, right? So all of those are his inventions and that was what was uh, put in. Also as well with like the mice and everything as well. So these kind of things are, are what was put in. You know, so this is the story which uh, Walt Disney decided to run with and the story of how this film was made stretches over many many different decades with many different writers and many many chefs in the kitchen in my opinion kind of spoiling the broth but anyway we'll talk about that a little bit later but just know that the first time uh, that Disney uh, tried to make a, a film about Cinderella was all the way back in 1922 so this is when they were doing laughograms so this is like very short kind of like cartoons and stuff so Disney made uh, that in 1922 and then in 1933, he wanted to turn this into a silly symphony. So like we said before about silly symphonies, right? Uh, yeah, that's what he kind of wanted. However, over time, there ended up being so many little add-ins and there ended up being so many different gags that were, were put in that it ended up becoming a thing where it was too long to be a short film and it started heading more towards it being a feature-length film. And it was decided at this point that they were going to shelve the idea for a little bit just because they had lots of other things going on at this time and they had other projects that they thought were more pressing that they wanted to kind of focus on. 
1938, Walt Disney uh, commissions uh, Al Perkins uh, to write a 14 page uh, outline of what Cinderella should look like. And, you know, this is like the first draft here, this is like the first treatment. So this ended up being built on in 1940 by uh, two female writers, right? So this is Dana Coffey and this is uh, Bianca uh, Magali. So we've mentioned uh, Bianca Magali in the Pinocchio video. Check her out for more of the kind of like background details with her. But yeah, so they worked on this, but nothing really came from it. And it was a thing where in 1933, this is when Dick Humor and Joe Grant, who we've mentioned in other videos as well, they were called in uh, to work on this project. But by 1945, things got halted, yes, again, because A, like we've said with many different things, budget constraints, World War II, blah, 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 blah. If you've seen our other videos, you'll know what we're kind of talking about. So we'll kind of skip over that for now. But these are the reasons why it kind of got shelved for a while. So in 1945-1946, yeah, like we said, uh, we also had the Song of the South. That was our previous video, definitely check that out. But as we said with that, there was a tension between the writers. So Maurice Rapp, he had been a writer for that and ended up being a little bit of falling out. So during this period where uh, they were falling out, Disney got him to work on Cinderella. So Rapp, he was a Northern Jewish uh, communist and he wanted Cinderella's role to be a lot more rebellious. So it was a thing where, you know, if you look at obviously like the, the story as it is, and we'll talk about this a bit later in terms of the themes and the history, why it was like that, but she's very, very passive. She's very servile. She allows these strangers to come into her house and turn her into a slave. Don't know about you, but I don't know too many girls who would put up with that or too many boys, anyone, right? Who would put up with that? No one, right? And she does it all without complaining, without even really much of a like frown and stuff and she's just happy to, to kind of like live that life by, by and large so it's quite unrealistic so Maurice right uh, he wanted it to be a thing where in order for uh, Cinderella to end up being with the prince she had to rise up against the stepmother and against the stepsisters so you see this in the Cinderella story like we said uh, before the one in 2004 with Hilary Duff you know, in that one, she ends up rebelling against the evil stepmother and the stepsisters. And that's the only way that she kind of grows up, right? Because there's no kind of growth in the character of Cinderella here within like, the, the 50s version. But anyway, people didn't listen to Rap and he kind of got completely ignored on that front. Yeah, they just weren't listening to his suggestions. So anyway, so that didn't end up happening. So by 1948, there was a bit of a race going on at the Disney Studios between three different films. So you had Cinderella, you had Alice in Wonderland, and you had Peter Pan. So Disney said, whichever set of animators yeah, gets their thing finished first, that's the order in which we're going to release these films, right? So we're going to put all of our energy into whatever film ends up kind of getting ahead. So the animators for Cinderella happened to be ahead of the competition. And so it was decided that they were going to focus all their energy onto making Cinderella a thing. And this is also where they end up working a lot on the different uh, uh, mouse and cat sequence as well. So this is kind of why there's a lot of padding for the story. Uh, but anyway, like, so this is, this period here is the part to blame for that bit at the beginning. But we'll talk about that a bit later, right? Um, you can tell I get really annoyed by that. But anyway, so now that all the kind of padding had been done, sorry, now that all the writing had finally been finished, now the, the film was ready to be released in 1950. So I should also say as well that, talk about the story of the studio, there was a whole bunch of different behind the scenes thing uh, that we don't really have time to go into now, but a lot of it was kind of, there's financial issues, um, there's the fact that Walt wasn't as good as he had been before. So before he used to just kind of like let his animators do stuff and he used to just like chime in with like good ideas. Instead, he was kind of like absent for a lot of uh, the making of this. So then the animators would be like, well, OK, let's make something. And then when he'd come back, he'd be like, no, get rid of all that. Right. So lots of messy kind of stuff, lots of like backroom kind of like politics and stuff that that was kind of going on. But we don't really have time to get into it now. And it's kind of it's very it's, it's not really worth kind of really talking about. But still, we end up having it, the, the, the film being ready. But we obviously had to do the casting. So talking about the casting, uh, first of all, you had uh, Aline Woods. So she's the voice of Cinderella. And also as well, just in terms of other things that she was in, she's in The Godfather, but she's like one of the background people and she's not credited in that. 
and it's a thing where actually later on she would go to on uh, to sue Disney for royalties, yeah, for her voice. But anyway, that's like that was many decades afterwards, and it's very kind of messy. But in terms of who they got to model uh, uh, as Cinderella, they had Helen Stanley. So she was the live model for Cinderella, for Aurora in uh, Sleeping Beauty, and also for Anita in 101 Dalmatians, right? So, you know, wasn't like, she, you know, she didn't necessarily appear, appear in any films, but when you kind of look at that kind of archetypal uh, Disney princess, they based it off of her, uh, like her like physique, right? Then you had Eleanor uh, Audley. So she is the voice of Maleficent in uh, Sleep and Beauty. And in this, she also plays the villain who is Lady Tremaine. Then in terms of the voice of the fairy godmother, this is Verna Felton. We spoke about her more in the uh, Dumbo video. So check that out for more details with regards to what film she was in. Uh, you also had uh, Prince Charming and he is voiced by uh, William Edward Phipps. So Phipps wasn't in anything too major, apart from Julius Caesar, uh, which came out in 1953 uh, with uh, Marlon Brando. However, in that, he's just a servant, so nothing like too, too like, major of a role. Uh, one of the stepsisters, uh, she was uh, Lucille Bliss. You know, she plays voices in the following films. So you've got Alice in Wonderland, Peter Pan, 101 Dimensions, The Flintstones, and also The Smurfs, right? So really good like, like voice actress uh, for that. And then on top of that, you also had uh, Jimmy McDonald, and he plays uh, the voice of the male mice uh, within the film, and also several other kind of like animated kind of like animal uh, uh, voices, right? Uh, so we've kind of got one screen now. So just, yeah, so he, like he, he was in lots of different things, as you can see. So that kind of explains like the story of the studio and kind of like, you know, casting and all that kind of stuff. So now we're going to dive into the themes and the history of Cinderella. So major kind of themes within Cinderella are ones in which goodness, beauty and humility triumph over evil, vanity and arrogance. And actually I should say as well that Cinderella's character, right, even in spite of everything that happens to her, she still does not stay bitter, she doesn't become vengeful, she doesn't become spiteful in spite of everything which happens to her. And this is very, very different from uh, the, uh, you know, uh, the Brothers uh, Grimm version that we spoke about, where what happens in that is that afterwards she ends up, you know, now she's like the queen, she then like takes out like kind of all of her things like uh, on like the stepsisters and like on the stepmother and stuff, right? So she gets her revenge in that. However, in this version here, they didn't do that. The reason for that is because uh, Charles Perrault, who wrote this, at the time that he uh, wrote the story of Cinderella, and also as well, I should say, he wrote many other different stories as well. He wrote Sleeping Beauty, Little Red Riding Hood, and Puss in Boots, right? So he'd written many, many different stories. And the reason he wrote these stories at the age at which he did, which was around in his 60s, this is because he'd been busy all of his life. And now at this point, he wanted to spend more time with his family. He wanted to spend more time with his children and with his grandchildren. And therefore, the stories which he told were very moralistic, yeah, very much kind of like uh, teaching people how they ought to be. And also as well, obviously at the time, it was very much a kind of like a Christian vibes, right? So it's very much kind of um, the Sermon on the Mount kind of thing, you know, turn the other cheek, love your enemies, that kind of thing. So even at times where we look at that and go, that's kind of not normal human behavior to put up with that level of like nonsense and stuff. Still, it's a thing where, um, you know, Cinderella's character even if we might look at it and think this is just insanely servile and there's no way that anyone would ever pop this rubbish, she, in spite of that, puts up with it and in spite of that suffering, she ends up uh, going on to live a great life and gets everything that she wants. So it's kind of a good life lesson in a way that even if bad things happen to you, good things happen to good people. It's that kind of like uh, message, right? So that kind of explains why it's like that. And also as well, if you think as well, the 1950s uh, in, in America, were a time where people were very uh, religious, people were very much into family values. And this is a time where, you know, the baby boomer generation and stuff, you know, parents want their, their children to be taught these kind of values, yeah, of even if bad things happen to you, to like turn the other cheek and stuff. Maybe this is where the hippie movement came from. Who knows? Yeah, maybe, you know, the, the kids would have been around at this time. Anyway, may, maybe that's just a theory. But anyway, it's like, Anyway, whatever, yeah, maybe I'm just kind of like thinking too much into it and stuff. But still, now we're going to talk about the legacy of the film. Now, the thing is, with regard to the legacy, this is a bit controversial. 
Actually, it's not that I don't like the film at all. Um, the first half of it can just be flushed down the toilet, in my eyes, right? The first 20 minutes is pretty much completely taken up by the mice and the cat, right? And it's like Tom and Jerry without it being Tom and Jerry. Like, if I wanted to watch Tom and Jerry, I'd watch Tom and Jerry, right? But it's just gag after gag of, like, stuff which, like, I'm here to watch a film. Like, this doesn't move the story along at all. It's pointless. At times, it actually gets quite boring. And if I were going to watch this in the cinema, I would have walked out, yeah, but like kind of by the 15th minute, because I was like, this is not, what is this story? I don't know what's happening. Like, what is it? Anyway, so once you get past all of that, and once you get about like 30 minutes into the film where the, the story starts to kind of pick up and stuff, that's when you go, okay, I understand now why this is so, just such a magical film. Because, you know, especially um, when you have like, you know, the different songs in it, right? So I can't lie. This is a little bit sad, but see the songs, um, you know, like the kind of like uh, Cinderella song, yeah, like that, that my sing, and also the bop, bib, dee, bop, dee, boop, whatever that song there. Oh, it's that one, yeah, okay, right. That I've been playing on loop for the last two days in the preparation for, 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 for filming this, right? It's a little bit sad, but it's just mad catchy, and so I just have kept playing it. So, they're obviously good songs and stuff, right? And also as well, it's just like, yo, know, the film, once it kind of gets into the story, is really, really like well put together. It's so graceful. It's so elegant. Like when you're watching it, it's just absolutely magical and stuff, right? So that's for the second half. The first part, meh, that can just be flushed down the toilet, like I said. But the thing is, obviously, a lot of people must at least share my opinion on that because, yo, know, the film had a huge, huge legacy, right? So... First of all, in pure kind of like monetary terms, right? The film cost almost like $2 million to make, and yet it made $182 million at the box office. So this was hands down the most commercially successful Disney film since Snow White, right? So, you know, really, really was, like, blew things away. It really helped uh, Disney Studios out because obviously they now had like kind of a lot of revenue, whereas before they were having to cut corners and they having to do all these different things. Now they would have the money to be able to invest in, in, in making like really great films and stuff once again. So they didn't win any Academy Awards. However, they were nominated for three of them. And it was a thing where over the course of the film's lifetime, it has had a lifetime, a gross figure of $565 million when adjusted for inflation. So it's absolutely astronomical in terms of the success of the film. And now we've uh, kind of like covered the legacy. Now we can talk about the notable lines and notable effects. So in terms of the notable lines, um, there aren't any particular like great lines and stuff. There's no like... You know, there's no memorable lines as such. However, for argument's sake, we will put in uh, two clips now. So we have this one. Happy birthday. And we also have this one. But don't you think my dress? Yes, it's lovely, dear. Lo good heavens, child. You can't go in there. So yeah, both of those are kind of kind of funny, but it's like, yeah, whatever. Um, <laughs> but in terms of the uh, special effects, this is where I think the film really steals people's hearts and stuff. Because visually speaking, it's so beautiful at certain points, it's almost as if it's a live action film. Some of the angles that they have are just like phenomenal. And, you know, I'll, in fact, I'll just leave things on screen now and stuff, yeah, just while I'm talking, just so you get an idea of the different shots and stuff, yeah, like, there's so much thought that went into these things, uh, there's so much kind of, like, great direction, you know, it really shows, like, the level of artistic skills that went into this, yeah, and it pays off, yeah, you can see why commercially this it was so successful, because, like I said, the beginning bit, the story is just a bit meh, but... By the ending, you go, wow, this was really worth me watching. Yeah, I would highly recommend this to people. So that finishes off Cinderella. And if you enjoyed that uh, and you want to see more things, don't forget, obviously, to hit the like button. Subscribe if you haven't already. Hit the bell button to stay notified. Also, as well, check out our other film videos. Um, and also, as well, if you're interested in history, not everyone is interested in history. But if you're very interested in history and politics and stuff, we have had a long history of having other things on this channel as well. So dip your toes into that as and when. And next week's video is going to be 
Alice in Wonderland, right, from 1951. So we're going to talk about the history of that, but in the meantime, have a great day and bye.